No. And I know a lot of people watching this are new clinicians, they're educators, mm-hmm. there's some parents. So you kind of provided me with four questions to ask you. Why do children in the foster care system tend to have low self-esteem? The low self-esteem is that egotistic part of themselves that believes it was all their fault. And yeah. children typically who've experienced trauma believe it was all their fault. And how I explain even to children and parents what's going on in your child's internal world. Mm -hmm. So shame is directed towards the self. Guilt is directed towards the behavior that caused distress for that person. What happens? So shame versus guilt. Like I am bad and I did something bad. It's different. Exactly. So children who go through the foster care system and no one's helping them understand it was not your fault. They're going to walk around believing it was their fault Mm. and they're going to perceive themselves as bad, worthless, unlovable. Mm. And the child feels that there's nothing they can do to fix that because that's who they are. You see, that's who they believe they are. As a result, they're likely to deny, lie, make excuses about their behavior, and especially blame others for their behavior. Oh, you just Uh described it. You just described it. That's what a lot of times is like the presenting concerns. Yes. It's rooted in shame. Red flags that you know you're, you're working with a child who has shame or even pervasive shame. It's just day in and day out red flags are they take everything personally so any criticism Mm. they don't see as constructive they see it as you're attacking me with out of proportionate response real upset exactly they can't differentiate themselves from their behavior it's all one it's all mashed together like mashed potatoes and and the way i explain is imagine you're in a bubble and in that bubble there's a mirror Mm -hmm. and the mirror only reflects your bad self. It just shows your ugliness, your deficiency, your terrible, the worst of the worst you could imagine. Mm. And that's how they're walking around with this bubble. So when someone goes, hey, you made a mistake, they go, I'm the mistake. I'm a mistake. They can't realize it's not my behavior. It's me as a whole person. Mm. What happens is excessive shame impedes the development of guilt, which is so important mm. for kids. And yeah, it, it's, it's a tough one because parents get confused because they tend to see the child, they can't apologize. It's not yeah. that they won't, the won't can't metaphor. It's they can't because when they apologize, when the parent goes, oh, you just made, you just did something wrong. The child believes they're all wrong. And the parent goes, well, you need to go take responsibility for that. And if you're not trauma-informed or attachment-informed, you're actually going to reinforce shame in your child. Because when you say, go apologize to your sister, this is what the child does. And I always act this out for clinicians and therapists and social workers and parents. So the child fights the parent. You know, there's that control battle. I don't want to go apologize. Usually parents exhort to consequences, threatening, which is not adoption competent, um, to get the child to do the right thing. But the parent is not understanding that the child's being forced to apologize, not from their own internal sense, but from an external threat to Mm. their existence. It makes it worse. It makes it worse. Exactly. And the child will go up to that kid and go, I'm sorry. But what are they really saying? Say, I am sorry. I'm like a bad person. I'm not good enough. I- and it's so painful. And I was one of those kids that it made me feel worse because mm-hmm. I now I'm validating how bad I am. And then I'd go off and I would be left with all these feelings. I'm such a bad person. Oh. It took me years to build self-esteem. Oh my goodness, you just explained it. I have never quite looked at it in that light. So forcing an apology or putting shame and threat or punishment in these situations actually exacerbates the problem. Exactly. Worse. Yeah. 
So there is an intervention that I developed, which came out of Holly Van Gilden, who's another wonderful therapist. She's been around for years. She's like a Violet Oaklander, oh. but it's the world oh. of foster care and adoption. She really helps parents understand attachment and trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she had this metaphor, you need to help the child separate themselves from their behavior. Mm -hmm. And she, she mentioned the word sandwich. You have to do this sandwiching. And I said, mm -hmm. oh, that's really interesting because I'm always trying to, what do adults say? And then bring it down to the child yeah. brain. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that's then I created, how you made the handy model of the brain for kids. Oh, okay. And I created the shame witch. Oh, oh my goodness. That's so clever. <laughs> which I'll oh put a goodness. link below. Oh, okay. Oh my goodness. That's so, brilliant. Okay. So the bread on which the, the top of your best friend inner voice is you. Wow. Okay. So explain it. Yeah. So the shame, which is, so if, if you recognize your child is living in shame or as a therapist, you're going to teach the parent this technique. The parent needs to then separate the child from their behavior and go, so the Bread on the bottom is the validation, is the okay. stroking, is the pulling out the goodness in who they are. Mm -hmm. You're a good person. You're doing the best that you can. We all make mistakes and that's how we learn. And the pickle, the lettuce, tomato, all that stuff we're dealing with. Yeah. We're, it's a narrative approach, which is what this is. That's the mistake that we're going to work on, that we're going to look oh, at together, that we're going right to figure right. out, we're going to problem solve. That math problem is wrong. You're not wrong. The math oh. problem is wrong. Oh, You're God. not a mistake. Oh. The mistake is the mistake. Ooh. And then the bread on top to sandwich it all together is your good person, that inner best friend you. Children who have pervasive shame don't have this part developed. It's so minute. It's like a speck. Yeah. So we're growing that part. You're a good person. This growth mindset. You're learning. It's okay to make mistakes and tell yourself you're not the mistake. The mistake, all this stuff is the mistake. Oh, so separate yourself yeah. from the problem. You write this out with the child. Oh, okay. So they can really kind of put their own um, stuff in there. So what I hear you saying is that really it's shift in that internal dialogue that felt sense for the kid, like, I'm not the mistake, or I'm not bad, or I'm not worthless. It's what had happened. Oh, right. that, that's a life changer. The circumstances in my birth mother's life at that time, that she couldn't parent any baby born on my birthday. Like it wasn't about me. And the moment we narrative and take that, put that story in its place, we yeah. can then have objectivity. Mm. When we have objectivity. Yeah, it takes it out we, of that. Yeah, we have awareness. We can look at it and reflect on it, think about it, process it for greater mental health. Oh, that's so good. Oh my goodness. That one piece. I can imagine what your program is like. I can imagine what it's like <laughs> to be your client. Okay. So let's go with question number two. What intervention is helpful? Oh, the shame witch. So we did that one helpful to help them feel better about themselves. I love that's so clever too. the shame, witch. And I think about Dr. Siegel, obviously we're yeah. both big Dr. Siegel fans, uh -huh. but name it's tame it. That's what that is. Exactly. Exactly. So exactly. good. Now the third one, what interventions help a child with grief and loss, which you told us about, that's like a big part of it, the grief and loss. Yes. Yeah. We, we must understand. And there's an adult adoptee who said, it feels like a wake. We're just sitting in a wake mm. that has not been able to have a proper ceremonial there's no closure. There's no, maybe closure. not even any identification of it. Just like, yeah. uh, just going to a different place and wow. Right. And, and snap out of it, get over it. Right. Go to school. Like, it's just like, it's insane. What we expect the adult characteristics we project on children it yeah. is just insanity. And Bruce Perry says that the brain does not fully develop until the age of 31. 31. That's older than I thought. Yep. Goodness. Gosh, yeah, I did make some stupid decisions before 31. <laughs> of course, your 20s. You do. You're trying to figure out who you are. 
yeah. what you want. You're mastering your skill set. Uh huh. And you're making a lot of mistakes, which is what you want to do in your 20s <laughs> yeah. and learn. And learn from them. Jeanette, something's crossing my mind when I think about the grief and loss. So I, my friend, she's like a fantastic clinician. She talked about when kids move, a lot of times they're carrying a, because she starts my heart, a bag, a garbage bag with their yes. stuff in it. So mm-hmm. she would provide a, like a duffel bag or something like that. Oh, yes. There's what, many organizations um, that do that now because we understand. I was one of those oh, kids. I had a garbage bag from my foster home to my adoptive oh, home because yeah, what was that like? What was uh, that like? That I think was what I always had this metaphor and, and think of imagery when you're working with children. You know, what what do you if you could describe yourself in an image, what would you be? And mm. my image was I was a piece of garbage. I was a piece of garbage Mm. and that's when I attempted to end my life and I was 13 and it it wasn't until I went into therapy and went, Oh my God, I actually believe I'm a piece of garbage that I started to think about that. And I also felt like I was a crumpled up piece of paper and because I was so tense and trying to bind all of this anxiety and contain it all. And I didn't have any of these interventions And it just was stuffed inside me like a crumpled up piece of paper. And then I learned, and through that metaphor, I learned to hold that piece of garbage, smooth it out, open it, look at it. And then I wrote the words, I love you. You're worthy. You're important. I needed to learn how to matter to my own self. Oh, that's when the healing it's so that's when that changed because I mean, obviously it's shifted yeah. since then. Yeah. And I felt so bad about myself. And so most children, and I'm going to say most have this part of themselves for some of them, if they've been with their family for a long time, they have a greater sense of self, of course. And maybe there was just a, a one um, acute trauma, you know? Yes. single incident trauma that led them to enter the foster care system. And they actually are okay. They have a good self-esteem. Um, but some kids, the younger they are, the harder it is for them to make sense and separate themselves from the circumstances of their experience of why they were removed from their foster families or oh my goodness. families of origin. So they're left with just all this stuff inside. So yeah, even the, the garbage bag metaphor, uh, yeah. I do arts festivals uh, for foster youth and adoptees. And um, even just that metaphor of what, if you have a feeling like you're holding all this baggage, well, what's in there? Yeah. Let's identify what's in that bag, baggage. Put it out. And let's, let's pull it out. Oh, yeah. gosh. One by one. Because it, for a clinician, you have to, get comfortable with being uncomfortable because a lot of children in foster care have very intense, overwhelming experiences. And that's a muscle that I learned, but I would, when I first started doing this work and I come from the experience, I would leave sessions crying, just feeling so much for these children. And then realizing too, wow, like I didn't have it that bad. Like I didn't have chronic abuse. Yeah, it actually helped me go, okay, well, I'm going to give back and I'm going to learn how to tolerate this experience with them. That's the only way they're going to learn to tolerate it within themselves. Oh, like an external regulator. And now you're teaching us all this stuff. Oh, yeah. I love teaching. See, that's something that for me, when I was in therapy, I didn't get a lot of psychoeducation. And I'm really big on these interventions, like the shame witch. And so the other one that I wanted to share was my sad bag. So when I started working with kids, like what's an intervention, maybe hard to see, but. Oh, okay. Things to do when I feel sad, whoops, to help my broken heart feel glad. That's just what's written on my sad bag. Oh, I love (laughs) it. Things to do when I feel sad to help my broken heart feel glad. So it's a coping skill, sad bag. I'm teaching them skill sets to be competent in their experience. And I do have 
children's mental health videos that I've created two on my YouTube channel. And one of them is how to make a sad bag for kids. Oh, of course. And I do. literally am talking to kids going, here's how you make a sad bag. <laughs> my secret wish. And I want to say this, I've always loved, I would love to have a kid's TV show, but is any producers listening? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would watch it and I would tell I would everybody I know to watch it too. <laughs> I grew up on Mr. Rogers. Yeah. I would just sit and I, and I remember I was in foster care and I would sit, Mr. Rogers, I felt was talking to me because he was the only person who really started talking about feelings. Yes. And having an experience mm -hmm. and, and I could hear him and slowly make sense. I think he was a big part of my Ooh. development, Mr. Rogers. Oh, yeah. He was a resource for you. You were able to Ooh. kind of identify Wow. So in the sad bag, so there's a tear scream pillow. The child can draw their feelings on their tear pillow. And then of course provide parent provides empty right. pillowcase, put the pillow in there. So the child can go to the tear pillow and cry and mm -hmm. all the tears can be held and be externalized. And there's a place and a space for these feelings. Okay. Because that they will cry beautiful. and it's important to cry. Yes. Then there's paper. You can journal if the child's young enough to journal. Mm -hmm. and I'm showing you different samples. I like the number three. Have Me the two provide the options and mm -hmm. ask the child what three interventions will work for you because we need to also instill in them you are the expert in your life. Yes, it puts them in that that they're they um can what do they call it that self-actualization like where they can be in charge of they can be the yes. boss themselves yes with your support uh, in the beginning then a photo book is just putting pictures of things that make you feel good like what pictures that, oh my gosh that make is that a pig with boots that yeah. makes that would be in my book <laughs> <laughs> right oh, what can it. make you just feel good and have gratitude so this could be a gratitude journal could be a picture that makes you just feel oh. silly and good to shift you out of. And it doesn't have to be like this. Again, we're thinking out of the box. It could be 10 index cards that you staple together, mm -hmm. right? We're, we want to be creative, innovative therapists when we're working with children, always adaptable. I always mm -hmm. find myself having to really key, stay so open-minded and adaptable. Because you need to kind of think on your feet because something may present oh. itself and you have to kind of know like what, what needs to be done here and what, what's happening that can meet exactly. that. Exactly. And then the other thing is I put worry dolls too, as an item in the sad bag, because worry dolls, there's a lot of worry with sadness. Usually there's something unresolved, there's something there still understanding, and it gives them an opportunity to externalize and put words to it. So each worry doll, you take the worry doll, it's actually, it comes from Guatemala. It's an old legend. Oh, that, you know, know, they're tiny, them. right? They're little tiny dolls that have little string wrapped around them. Yeah, so beautiful. And you take the doll out before bed, tell each doll a worry or what you're feeling, then you put the dolls back into the bag and you put the bag underneath your pillow and throughout the night, the worry dolls are going to think and talk about and problem solve these worries. And when you wake up in the morning, you'll feel more relieved, right? But that's the myth. That's, that's when the you said that. <laughs> <laughs> and it also helps the clinician understand what's going on in here. Yeah. That is crucial because a lot of these kids hide it. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to be open and acknowledge, and they don't know. It's vulnerable. It hasn't been safe yeah. for them in the past. So we say, hey, the dolls are going to hold it for you. So I had this one kid, funny story, talking about being adaptable yeah. as a therapist. So we did. I did this with her, and she believed, and she was in foster care, that her birth mother was going to come back and kidnap her. Okay. We had no idea she was thinking this until she scary. made the sad bag. And I said, wow that's a big feeling you're having. Oh, and then what we did was we did a safety all around her house that she's safe and, and mitigating that her birth mother even knew where she lived just to fact mm -hmm. check. That's so powerful. Irrational belief, but irrational based in, you know, she was scared because she had had visits with her first with her birth mother, first okay. mother it was different terms. She felt that her mother was going to come. And I think her mother may have told her, I'm going to come back and get you. 
Okay. So she accused of danger. Exactly. Would, would flip her lid or her lid probably didn't even go fully down if she's, but she didn't even know before the bag that she was even, that was even right. a thing for her. We had no idea. So Fear. when I, and I was doing in-home therapy because a lot of, when you're working with children and child welfare within the system, you're actually traveling to their homes mm -hmm. and I would do therapy in their wombs. And my whole back of my car was filled with play therapy items. And I've been um, there before, like when yeah. you open the door and like balls <laughs> fall out and blocks. And <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Crayons all over the place. Um, I know. And so she, uh, so I walk in the door and she's mad at me and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. And I'm a new therapist. I'm going, oh no, did I help her or hurt her? And she said, and she's like stamping her foot, like patting her foot. And she's got her arms crossed. And I go, oh, hi, how are you doing today? She says, I'm mad at you. And you know, I, I'm a therapist, validate, validate. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Let's talk about this today. I'd like to know what you're mad at. What did, what happened? What did I do? What did I say? Tell me. Like we just go right into the trauma, right? And she goes, those worry dolls didn't work. Oh, so she and I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And I, and I just thought for a minute, I said, just allow yourself to process this. And I always repeat in my mind what kids say. It helps me yeah. stay connected. And I go, hmm, the worry dolls didn't work. And then I thought, I know what we're going to do today. We're going to make bigger worry dolls. Oh. And you know what she said? Yeah. And it became, see, like we expanded. Yes. We just, I saw it wasn't enough. That's so and I, I thought, what is it? It's lacking something. It wasn't enough. Let's make it big enough. So you can take one little intervention and make it bigger. Like even what I'm showing you in the sad bag can be one session. So yes. I also have a wish book. So it's mm -hmm. a wish because with children in foster care, they do have a lot of wishes mm. and wishing is also another way we work through depression because we have something we're looking forward to. Oh, it gives us, oh, I think about there's that future. It's not when you're stuck in, say, like dorsal vagal shutdown freezers, it's hard to even consider the future that puts them yes. into things could change, I, things could get better. It gives hope. Yeah. And I like kids to, if there's a, a, a wish that's possible, I will. And, and I do a lot of family therapy sometimes. I'm working with a child alone, but I'll go, is there one wish you think we could tell your mom or dad or your grandma? to come mm. true, to make him come true. Oh. So that there's that follow through, right? We're not just wishing for random things. Let's see if we can put reality to one of these wishes because uh -huh. that also solidifies on being acknowledged, heard, yeah. seen, I matter. received, I matter, right? Mm. And then there's paper to draw a picture about my sad feelings. Mm. You want to just, you know, simple. These are simple little things. And then I have sad busters and I make these cards. So they're just blank <laughs> parts. Sad Buster. So creative. You can even just write Sad Buster. You don't even, you can use a little yeah. index. And uh -huh. then you write on the back what you're doing with your sad. Oh, say loving kindness to the person I miss. Three wishes. Oh, that's so good. And so simple. I mean, so simple. it doesn't take any. Um, exactly. Yeah. Ask my parents for a hug, right? That's a need. We need to, a lot of kids do need to just be held by their parents and just cry. Yes. Not talked out of it. A lot of working with the child who's grieving is learning to be with their grief, not talk them out of it, not them. feel them out of it, just hold them. Mm. And go, yeah, it's okay to cry. It's okay. You have a lot to cry about. Mm. Oh. And I was one of those kids. My mom would say, because she wasn't adoption company, she goes, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Oh, so there's some shame. Like uh, you're, you're. So I, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. And then I had, then I had to do this. Okay. Just stuff it down. Stuff it down, stuff it down. And, and so I had a lot of anxiety and, and the repression is what causes, causes anxiety. And yeah. depression and anxiety are, there's a swing like pendulum. They actually yeah 
counterpart each other. Uh, go get my bubbles. So bubbles blow three wishes into the air. Oh, I love that. So they can have bubbles. That was good because it has a breath work. Yeah. Go to my mirror and make a funny face really big. Yeah. Hey, real quick, Jeanette, let's make yeah. a funny face. Three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> You have to be playful to be a play therapist and work with children. <laughs> a little bit crazy. <laughs> yeah, you have to get out of your way. Yeah. And the more you practice, the better you get. Just it makes you safe. You it makes it you does. I, it makes me feel young working with children. I love it. Yeah. Like, I can't imagine what it's like to be your, uh, be your client. I mean, I literally, I feel your love. I feel your passion in um, your knowledge base is like fascinating. I, I mean, I've done a lot of research because I was like, what did I need? What did I need? And I needed a lot. And that's where my interventions came out of. And that's when I wrote my first book, Groundbreaking Interventions, Working with Children in Foster Care and Adoption. When it has all these interventions, my anger bag, my sad bag, my stress bag, um, how to tell my adoption story, the question box. Oh, so good. And so the last intervention that I'll share with this, and then you want to put crayons in the sad bag too. Okay. This is called a comfy doll. Mm -hmm. C-O-M-F-E-E. -E. Now, this is something I add, especially with young children. It can represent the person that they've lost oh, well. and they're grieving for. And really, these, you can get them on griefwatch.com. I don't make okay. them, but they okay. are handmade and they're filled with lavender. And you can actually put them in the microwave for a minute. Oh. And they're warm. Oh, okay. Grief watch. And I think that warmth, the neuroception of safety and the softness, even just looking at you're holding it and I can read the way that your body, and I know you like lavender because you showed me you have a little bottle yeah. of lavender right yeah, by you. Want, yeah. You want to make sure though, first kids aren't allergic to lavender. I always have to yeah. make sure. You can imagine you're breathing in your birthday cake instead of using lavender. Okay, wait, wait, what, what, breathing in your birthday cake, like, <sighs> yeah, birthday so cake. imagine, imagine your birthday cake, and it's, a, make it a big one, in big. front of you, and just, it might be an ice cream, cream cake, cake smells like, and go, <sighs> mm, right, it smells so good, it does smell good, do we blow out any candles, or no, yeah, let's blow out some candles, <gasps> <Okay>. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> there's a lot of candles there. Oh my gosh. This has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So say, we say your website one more time. It's down below. And, um, can you find the competency course like through the link? Is that all in the same place? Yes. Yeah, so I do have three websites because okay. you have I three. have like, therapy practice. You like, three. Mm -hmm. I like three. Too. <laughs> I like three. Like three. And I have Jeanette Yoff, which just has stuff that I, articles I've written. Uh, and then I have Celia Center, which is my nonprofit, okay. which has all my courses on it. Okay. Celia Center. Okay. Celia Center is named after my first mother that I could not live with and grow up with. Okay. Oh, and you okay. named the center. Oh, yeah. that's beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. And what is foster care an animation and what is adoption animation also will be below. That's really yeah. wonderful to watch with kids and then start to have the conversation with them about what do you think is your story and yeah. what do you want to do to help make sense of? Is it a question box? Is it a sad bag? Is it an anger bag? Because all these interventions are in the videos as well. Okay, so that's something like people could even share with parents as a resource or put yes. on their website or something like that. And it's YouTube, so they can just watch it. Oh, so many great free resources you offer too. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has thank been you, amazing. Jackie. Well, you're amazing. And what you're doing here is fantastic. I learned from so many other therapists as well. So thank you for oh. all learning from each other. We're all the big learning. play therapy community. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay,